I'm Todd Clint. I am a SharePoint MVP. I've been doing this uh, SharePoint thing for 10, 12 years, something like that. I forget exactly. I kind of got uh, edged into it, and the next thing I knew, it was my job, and uh, been doing it ever since. Um, so I obviously do some speaking. I do some writing. Who here has this magnificent tome? Anybody? Uh, did you actually pay for it, or did you get it free somewhere? <laughs> Paid for it? Really? I'm so sorry. I am so... Uh, so there's an upgrade chapter in here, chapter uh, five. So we're just going to be reading from this. I'm going to pull up a chair, and we're just going <laughs> to go through that. So if you have the book, you can read along while I read aloud. Um, but so we got this. I've got a few of these to give away. Now, the thing about these books is they're super heavy. There's like three and a half pounds or... 72 stone or 14 kilogram, I can't remember all that. Um, but I don't want to take these home with me. So what's going to happen is I'm going to saddle some of you guys with these books. Uh, so if you ask good questions or compliment me in some way, I will, uh, I'll give you a card and you can go down to the Rackspace booth and get one. And then if you don't plan on immediately putting it on eBay, I will, uh, I'll sign it for you and write something in it too. So keep that in mind. But there is the upgrade chapter. And I will say that I wrote this book like three years ago. So some of it's still good, some of it I've learned a few things since then, so some of it's going to be a little different. Uh, but I do have a handful of those to give away. Um, most of the things that I'm going to talk about today are things that I have screwed up myself doing upgrades. I'm not very smart, I make a lot of mistakes, and that works out well for you guys because that's what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be talking about how to upgrade and all the different facets of it and then all the things that I've done wrong, so hopefully you won't do them wrong. Uh, but again, as a consultant, that's uh, kind of what I did. I've got a blog. You can go to toddclint.com, and it's all about SharePoint stuff. And I throw in a little bit of, like, Windows Phone stuff and Windows 8 stuff because I'm, I'm kind of a nerd, and so that's the kind of things that I think about. But it's, uh, it's all admin -y stuff, so you can go there. I work for Rackspace. Uh, we're a hosting company. Got a big office here in London, and we've got uh, some hosting facilities here, but we're based out of the U.S., and we do SharePoint hosting. We do all kinds of other hosting. So you can go to Rackspace.com and see about that, or SharePoint.Rackspace.com to see specifically about the SharePoint offerings we have. Uh, single tenant, multi-tenant, all that. If you want to send me more uh, compliments and tell me what a great job that I did, or if you want a copy of that caricature for yourself, uh, you can email me, Todd.Clint at Rackspace.com, or hit me up on Twitter if you're one of those folks that like to waste time on the internet. I know I do. Uh, and then finally, I do a weekly SharePoint podcast, and you can go to toddclint.com slash netcast and see about that. I do it live, and then it's also on iTunes and all that stuff. The bad news is, for your local time, I record it live at 2.30 in the morning. So I wouldn't expect many of you to stay up for that. Uh, you'll, yeah, yeah, he, he'll just be getting started. He'll just be getting warmed up. Um, yeah, he'll be... Um, but so I, I talk about, you know, whatever stuff's happened in the previous week, patches that have come out, things like that. Um, you can get that on there. And I've also got that on YouTube. I got a YouTube channel and all that because that's where all the cool kids are at YouTube. So when you're done watching other people play video games and whatever else is on YouTube, you can, you can stroll over there. They make us uh, do agenda slides. So this is kind of my agenda slide. Uh, we're going to do some of that stuff. Now, the last one here, and I've got his laser pointer, so I feel obligated to point at stuff. We've only got two hours. We've got uh, this session, and then we get a break, and then that's, that's when you guys can make your exit and you know, forget to come back. Uh, but we've only got two hours together, and there's a lot of upgrade stuff to talk about. It's going to be tough for me to get everything in in two hours that I want to get in. The other thing is I want to make sure that if any of you have any upgrade questions, that we get them addressed. So start thinking about those things. Um, so to make things go more quickly, I'm probably not going to do any live demos. Uh, because then I have to type and talk at the same time, and it gets very confusing. So what I've done is I've recorded uh, one demo, a video that we'll watch and I'll talk about, it, and then I've got screenshots for the rest. Um, but that will help us move more quickly and try to get more content out. If anybody actually wants to see me do an upgrade, I'm happy to do one on the side or something if you want to walk through it. I do have machines set up, so if you've got a specific question, I can jump in and we can poke around. But unless there's a huge uh, outcry, I'm probably not going to do any live demos, uh, just for the sake of time to get more information out. Um, and I do, I've, I've done this session or a session like it a few times that does have live demos, so I can send you to recordings on that too if you want to see it. So any questions about what we're going to be doing, how quickly we're going to be doing it? All right, good. So like I said, I've been doing the SharePoint thing for a while. I've been doing it since the first version of SharePoint, so SharePoint 2001, and been you know, steadily upgrading. I do have, on one of my SharePoint 2013 farms, I do have a content database that started out in SharePoint 2003. 
that I've upgraded every single time just to see if it'll still go. Uh, and it does. So I've done a lot of upgrades. And the upgrade story has changed over the years with SharePoint. And the first uh, kind of big round of upgrades, for me at least, was going from SharePoint 2003 to SharePoint 2007. And that was, uh, that's what this story looked like. And we had three upgrade options. Any of you guys get to do the upgrade from 2003 to 2007? Good times, right? Yeah. It's good old days. They don't make them like they used to. Uh, so we had three options. We could do the gradual upgrade, which meant we installed SharePoint 2007 on our 2003 farm, gradually picked site collections and upgraded them. If something went haywire, in, in the unlikely event that something didn't go right, we could roll back to the 2003 version. Uh, it was pretty nice for guys like me that screwed up a lot. It was good, we had that safety net there. And then once we got everything over to 2007, we could uninstall 2003 and it would be great. And I think, um, 99% of the upgrades I did from 2003 to 2007 were the gradual upgrade. Um, the other one that we had was the database attach upgrade. So that meant we installed another farm someplace, and this was back in the dark ages before virtualization. So you actually had to have like more boxes, things you could kick. Um, and so you had to buy more computers, and you installed SharePoint 2007 on there, and then you brought your content databases over and attached them and upgraded them. And again, if anything went wrong, you had a safety net because your 2003 farm was kind of over to the side and kind of safe. And then we had the in-place uh, upgrade. That was for daredevils, you know, people who run with scissors, things like that. They did the, uh, they did the in-place upgrade. And that was when you did the upgrade, you installed SharePoint 2007 on your 2003 farm. Next, 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 finish, make it happen. And does anybody remember what happened if the upgrade failed? Well, there was good news and there was bad news. We'll start with the bad news. The bad news was there was no way to fix it or to try it again. So the good news was there was no thought process involved. There was no decision tree. It was restore from backup. That was very easy. Um, so nobody did those. I mean, that, that, worked, that worked like on stage for Microsoft folks at conferences is the only place that, uh, that ever worked. So that was what it looked like before. So as I'm coming into upgrade, you know, I've got these, these years of experience going on. And so then when SharePoint 2010 came out, had all these great new features and all this cool new stuff, and they, you know, they kept moving the site settings thing back and forth on the top of the page to kind of keep us on our toes. But one of the things that happened is we lost one of the upgrade methods. Um, and so the reason for this, you know, internally is everything that Microsoft has here, they have to test, and they have to test it in every situation. If you've got three upgrade methods, well, that's three times as many tests. If you get rid of one, you have, you have less testing. And of course, that was the one that I used 99% of the time. So that was, that was kind of a tough pill to swallow. But what they did say was, if you do the in-place upgrade, we're gonna fix some of the problems that made that fail. So now instead of failing 100% of the time, now it's only gonna fail maybe 50% of the time. And you'll be able to retry it. So if you've got a database that's got problems or something, you can start it and it can fail and you can try it again. Still not great, and then we still have the database attached method. So it was, uh, it was okay, we could, we could make that work. So now SharePoint 2013 comes out. We lose another upgrade method. So again, good news and bad news. The bad news is they took away all the upgrade methods but one. The good news is no decisions to make. It's all pretty simple. That's what you pick. Uh, but this does make me wonder, when we start seeing the stuff about SharePoint 2016, we've been losing upgrade methods one at a time every time we get a new version of SharePoint. <laughs> We're running out of methods to lose. So uh, there's a big conference in Chicago in a couple weeks, the Ignite conference, and I don't know if we'll find out the answer to that then, but uh, I'm very curious. Yes, sir? No, no problems with upgrade. No problems with upgrade? Yeah, it works every time. That's the guarantee, yeah. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll talk about that. But that's, so that's what we've got. So I guess going forward, um, if you, so how many of you have actually done an upgrade so far? Most of you. How many of you are here because you're going to do an upgrade? Okay, so good news. I just decided how you're going to upgrade for you. So we got that out of the way. Um, yeah, so it, it's the thing, and we're, so we're going to spend the rest of the time today talking about database attach and all the, the pieces of that to make that work. I'm also going to be guzzling coffee so I don't just fall asleep right on stage. It's only happened once. So, so the other thing is we have another secret method, and that's third-party tools. And we're going to talk about that in a, a little more in depth later on, uh, but that's going to be like the, the Metalogics, the Avpoint, uh, the ShareGate, all those kind of folks that have these third-party tools. How many of you guys have used third-party tools in the past to migrate stuff around? Has it been a good experience for you? No. no. Uh, so, I've, again, I've been doing this forever, and it's been a pretty bad experience. 
until the last year or two, and a couple of things have happened. Number one, SharePoint Online happened, and you can't get to the server on SharePoint Online, obviously. And so Microsoft has had to add a bunch of things to the product that lets you get things in from outside, and that's trickled down into on-prem. So now these, these people that make these migration tools and these upgrade tools have more things at their disposal to use inside of SharePoint, and the tools have gotten a lot better. Uh, so if you've tried one of these third-party tools in the past and you've been hurt, you know, you had to go shower with your clothes on, you felt terrible afterwards, give them another shot uh, because they have gotten a lot better uh, in the last year or two. And all of those guys are downstairs, or I guess on the other side of the wall there. Most of them, if not all of them, have evaluations that you can try. So don't let any past uh, problems dissuade you from doing that. And again, we're going to talk more about when you'd use one of those later. So we've talked about the only option that we have out of the box is database attach. So it's important to know which databases you can attach. Um, so these are the supported databases that you can attach. And we're going to spend a little bit more time um, talking about these later on. But obviously content databases, because there's no point in upgrading if you can't bring over your content. So all your content databases are going to come across. And then we've got a bunch of different service application databases. Um, the first one is BCS, the Business Connectivity Services. So this is a database that stores all of your connections to your other uh, line of business applications. And so you can bring that over. Excuse me, with all of these, with the service application upgrades, the way that you do this is you bring your database over and restore it into SQL and apply your permissions and all that because, you know, hopefully you're using different service accounts and things like that. Uh, get it all put in place in SQL and then go into SharePoint 2013 and build a new service app. So in the case of BCS, we're going to, you know, central admin or if you want to show off PowerShell, build your BCS service app the way you normally would. Nothing special, no tricks. But when you specify the database name, give it the name of the database you just restored. And what's going to be, SharePoint's going to be smart enough when it creates that service app, it's going to say, hey, SQL, I want to create this database. And SQL's going to say, I got you covered. It's already here. And it's just going to attach it, and all your stuff's just going to be there. And it's going to upgrade it in place. And that's how all of these work for the most part. There's no tricks to it. Yes, sir? All, all these databases work for all previous three versions from 2007 to 2013? He said, does all of these versions work for all, the, uh, does all these databases work for all the versions? So you can only upgrade from one version back. So these are all 2010 databases. Uh, and that's, uh, so 2007 didn't have a bunch of those. Uh, so yeah, only one version. So you've only ever been able to upgrade from one previous version to the next version. Uh, so and I assume that's the way it's going to be with 2016, though we'll see. Hopefully we'll find out in another week or so. Um, but yeah, from, yeah, so the assumption from this is all 2010 out of the box. So with BCS, you do that. You upgrade all your BCS stuff's in there. Manage metadata, same way if you've got a bunch of things in your term stores, you've built that out, take that database, move it over to your new 2013 farm, uh, give it the permissions, and then just create a new managed metadata service app with that. Performance point, same way. Secure store, that's the one that stores all the credentials that you use for BCS and things like that. That database, the data in it is encrypted. So while you can bring it right over and it just attaches, you need to know that passphrase so that SharePoint can decrypt it, and then it'll work just fine. User profile service. Has anybody, uh, anybody dealt with user profile service? Anybody, uh, yeah, that little, uh, little stinker. So that one does the same thing. That one's a little tricky. Your user profile service app has three databases. Uh, profile, sync, and social. Two of those three upgrade. Profile and social upgrade, sync does not. Sync is kind of temp space. It's kind of, uh, it's like the user profile service writing stuff on the back of its hand while it's syncing things. Uh, so there's nothing in there that we need. So when you, when you upgrade that, you don't have to worry about that. So you take your profile database, your social database from 2010, bring them into 2013, again, fix the permissions and all that, and then create a new user profile service, point it at your existing social and your existing um, profile, and then it will create a new sync database in the background. The other piece of that that's tricky is if you forget and try to bring that sync database over, it is also encrypted. So there's like some uh, certificate keys and things you have to bring over, so it's not going to work. It's, even if, you, if you're like, ah, that guy didn't know what he's talking about, I'm going to bring it over, it takes some work to get that one over. Uh, but when you do that, that will bring in all your profiles. Now, if you're doing a simple thing, like you're just bringing your stuff over from AD, you may not need to do that, but anything that people have added to their user, uh, you know, their my sites, or if you, if you created any custom properties, things like that, uh, they're all going to go in there. Now, again, when you do this, this is all just 
content. It's all you know, people information. You're still going to have to go in and create your sync settings. You're still going to have to you know, sacrifice a chicken when you try to start that sync service, all that. Uh, all those fun things are uh, there. And that's another thing. Um, how many of you have, uh, have had, gone, had to go to a lot of work to get the sync service running in 2010? Did you guys fight that a lot? This is another one of those good news and bad news stories. Uh, the bad news is it's pretty much exactly the same in 2013. So the good news is all those techniques that you, you hard fought and won in 2010, you get to keep using them. You still get value from those because you still keep to do, get to do them all. Uh, but it's all pretty much exactly the same in 2013. Um, and the final one is search. Now, search itself has uh, several databases, but the only one that will upgrade is the administration database. Anybody want to guess why that is? So it's changed in 2013? So, well, search did change significantly in 2013. Any other ideas? The index. So for all of these, with the exception of search, everything is stored in SQL. It's all in the databases. Search has a bunch of stuff in SQL, but a bunch of stuff on the file system. It's got these big index files. So if you just brought the databases over, it would have no way to reconcile that with the index that you didn't bring over. So what they have done, though, is they've let you bring the search administration database over. So all of your you know, content sources and all that kind of stuff, all your crazy settings and your managed properties and all that, they will come over, but you'll have to run full crawls to populate the rest of it. So uh, it's not bad. It's not a bad combination or not a bad compromise. So that's out of the box. And again, we're going to talk about uh, a bunch of these more in depth later, but that's kind of the thing. Uh, any of you guys run a project server? Sorry. Uh, it's, it's mainly the same story. You got those three project databases and you, same thing. Here's a few notes on um, SharePoint 2010 and 2013. Unlike the 2003 to 2007, they cannot exist on the same server. So you can't do an in-place upgrade or any of that kind of stuff. The 2013 installer checks for that and will, uh, will throw its hands up in disgust if it finds 2010 on the same server. Um, how many of you guys did upgrades from 2007 to 2010? Yeah, what was the big problem with that? What was the place where you wanted to curse Microsoft the most? And there are many, but I mean the most. The what? Much more hardware. That's, that's a good one. The other one was to go from 2007 to 2010. You had to have 2007 at Service Pack 2. So if you had some rickety SharePoint 2007 farm that you know, you'd installed when you first found out about SharePoint, maybe spent a little bit too much time at the pub the night before and weren't really at the top of your game when you installed it, and you were afraid to put a patch on it, you couldn't upgrade it to 2010. You couldn't in place upgrade it to 2010. You couldn't take the databases and attach them to 2010. You had to be at Service Pack 2. And as a consultant, I had more than one customer who had an incredibly fragile 2007 farm that was not Service Pack 2. And we, would, we had to build a 2007 Service Pack 2 farm to upgrade their databases to so that we could upgrade them to 2010 because we, we, just, we didn't trust that farm to take Service Pack 2 for any number of reasons. Patching in 2007 was not the greatest. Um, so we all you know, screamed at Microsoft and were unhappy about that. So they've removed that restriction. So if your 2010 farm is RTM or later, everything will upgrade. So that's, that's good news there. Um, I will say that as the patches have come out for SharePoint 2010, you should be at least at Service Pack 2 because that thing came out about you know, seven years ago or something, I don't know, it's been out a while. Um, but a lot of the things that they put in, especially after the next version of the product comes out, so. A bunch of the patches in 2007 that came out after 2010 came out were things that fixed upgrade, jiggled things in just such a way that 2010 could upgrade them easier. Same goes for 2010. A bunch of the stuff that's been patched in 2010 in the last couple of years is things that will make your upgrade to 2013 go a little more smoothly. So those are good, but you don't need them. RTM or later uh, will upgrade. And like you said, definitely need more hardware. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one that's more art than science. But with every version of SharePoint, you know, we scream, we, we, you know, like in 2007, uh, that came out in you know, 2008, 2009 was kind of when Facebook and all that stuff got real popular and started taking hours of my day every day. And so we're like, oh, I wish SharePoint had social stuff and I wish it had all these things. And then SharePoint 2010 came out and it had those things and Microsoft said, okay, you asked for it and we gave it to you, but we need our pound of flesh. And that pound of flesh is more RAM, more CPU, all that kind of stuff. Same thing going from 2010 to 2013. It's got a whole lot more things and you know, pages render on lots of different devices and all that kind of stuff, but it needs this pound of flesh, and that pound of flesh is more hardware. Uh, so the thing that I tell people is you need maybe 50% more hardware, 
that's, it's, it's a thing you've got to kind of feel, feel out. But that doesn't mean if you've got four machines now, you need six. But it means if you've got four machines now and they're working hard, they're at the top of their game, CPUs are busy all, using a lot of RAM, then you might need two more. But if you've got four machines and they're barely breaking a sweat, you may not need more hardware. So this is one of those things that you're going to want to do when you test the upgrade. You're going to want to get some stuff in 2013, turn everything on you think you're going to use, and just see how it performs. Um, the hardware requirements are drastically different than 2010. It's still, you know, the 80 gig C drive. The RAM requirements have gone up. I think it's like 16 gig for every box now. CPU requirements have gone up a little bit. But this is one you're just going to have to feel out a little bit. Um, the other thing that I will tell you is in 2010, it was a good idea to put search, the indexing role, on its own box. In 2013, it's a great idea to put, 2013, uh, to put search on its own box. Have you guys, any of you guys had search, kill a box, chew up a box before? That, uh, so I'm an only child. I don't share well. I've never had to share well. I don't like to share. And I think maybe search was an only child as well because it doesn't seem to like to share very well at all either. Um, when the beta was going out and we first got the RTM bits and just hadn't figured everything out, all the time we would have boxes that would start moving sluggishly and I'd go into task manager and there'd be all these little node runner processes fighting and stealing all my RAM and stealing all my CPU. That's search, those node runner processes. So when I'm specking out farms, I always spec out the indexing role on its own server. Um, and that way that server can melt down and it can work as hard as it wants to. And the only bad uh, part that we're gonna see is that search results just aren't gonna, you know, if the query rolls on there, search results might not come back as quickly. If it's just the indexing role, our results might not be as fresh, but I get that one off uh, as quickly as I can. The other thing that I do that isn't necessarily an upgrade thing, but I always point search at itself for crawls. Do you guys do that? Yeah, good, okay, so we've, we've gotten the word out on that. So the other uh, insidious thing that search does is when it, ha so when search does a, uh, its indexing, you know, when it goes out to see what documents it's got, it, it views those documents the same way you do in a web browser. Uh, so the crawler wakes up and, uh, and you know, spins everything up and it says, okay, where do I need to go? I need to go to you know, portal.contoso.com. It goes out to DNS, it resolves portal.contoso.com. It gets an IP address, which is probably a load balancer or something that you've got. And then it hits that load balancer and says, uh, you know, portal.contoso.com, show me your change log, what has happened in the last two hours. And SharePoint gives it back a bunch of documents and all that. And then it just starts hammering that load balancer, which then hammers your web for an end, which then hammers SQL and all up and down the stack. But the thing is, it goes in the same way your users do. And it's got, you know, your users are trying to do stuff. Search has nothing better to do with its time than just grab as many documents as it can. And it can have a really bad impact on performance for end users. And then what do they do? They call you. And there's nothing worse than that. And they call you and they're like, SharePoint slow. Uh. Nobody wants that, that I'll, I'll go to great lengths to prevent that. So one of the things that I do is I put share, uh, search and I point it back at itself. So I turn the web front end roll on, on my index server, and I have it index itself. So that does a bunch of things. That keeps load off of my load balancers and my web front ends and all that, but it also reduces some load on the common pieces that my users are seeing. So that if it overloads a web front end, it overloads itself. And then again, the only collateral damage is your search results might not be as fresh. How do you point it to itself? Okay, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. There's the easy way and there's the right way. <laughs> I do it the easy way, unfortunately. Uh, so, and, and, and again, this is one of those things that I've been doing this since SharePoint 2007, so I've got that institutional knowledge. Um, what I do is on every SharePoint server, search or whatever, I go into the host file on that box and I point it at itself for all of my URLs. So portal.contoso.com, 127.001. You know, mysite.contoso.com, 127.001. And so that, that does the search thing, that tricks search and, and points search back at itself. Um, and that also has another great side benefit that if you're ever troubleshooting anything, once you get these big farms and you've got a couple web front ends, you've got a couple search servers and a couple app servers, when you start troubleshooting things and things start getting handed off to different servers, it's almost impossible to figure out which log file to go to. So if you've got a server pointed to itself, you can cheat and you can log into that server and hit the web page, and then you know everything's gonna to dump to that local file. So that's the, that's the easy way to do it. And I've got a PowerShell script that does that, that essentially does a you know, get sp alternate URL, opens up the host file, writes them all back in, and I'll 
put a link to that out in that, uh, that URL. That's the easy way. That falls down a couple of places though um, because I do that when I install SharePoint. So I, I've got a, a list that I have never published of all the things that I do when I install SharePoint. And one of the things I do after I create all my uh, web applications is I run a script that goes through and puts all those URLs in my host file. Also shuts off the loopback detection, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but then if I come back a year later, so if I do this for a customer, I look like the smartest man alive when I do this, and I tell them this story and I seem very smart and all that. And then a year later, they create another web app. They don't remember any of this stuff. They don't remember the script or any of that kind of thing. And so now there's a, something else going on and some things are slow and some things are fast. You gotta rerun that script. You gotta keep adding those URLs. That's one place it falls down. The other place it falls down is a little thing called host name site collections. Any of you guys using host name site collections? Yeah, so the problem with host name site collections is every one of those is its own host name. So instead of being portal.contoso.com slash site slash IT, now the site collection is it.contoso.com. And if you're doing that, you're probably doing it on a large scale. You probably didn't create like three of them and then stop. So my easy method falls down there because every host name site collection you create doesn't get included there. So starting with SharePoint 2010 and included in SharePoint 2013, there's a web app a property you can set in the property bag that says, uh, I can't remember what the name of the property is and I can put it out somewhere, that says for, you know, for search crawls, go to this web front end. And so you set it at the web app level and then when the crawler wakes up and hits the web app, it looks for that property and then you, it would have its own name in there or multiple names. So you could say, uh, I've got these two web front ends that customers use and I've got these two web front ends that search abuses. And you can put those in that list and it will go back and forth. So if I forget to put a note out there about that, uh, let me know, But because I can't remember the name of that property. So the other thing I wanted to mention, oh, yes. Oh, does that work okay with SSL? Does that work okay with SSL? Um, that does add a little bit of complication to it. In, in most cases, uh, these days, uh, we use wildcard search for everything, so we just make sure the certs are on the search server as well as uh, that. Or depending on, you can also set up, um, we're gonna get into the weeds here, um, search, gets super fussy if it doesn't crawl the default zone URL. And so depending on how you're doing SSL and where it's getting terminated and all that kind of stuff, you can get tricky and say, well, the, you know, the default zone uh, URL will be HTTPS portal.contoso.com, but I'm gonna create this other URL that's not SSL for search to crawl, then you're gonna lose, lose things like security trimming and weird stuff like that. So the best bet is to just put it on all of them. That's, uh, that's normally what we do. The other thing I wanna talk about is the loopback detection. Have you guys all done battle with the loopback detection? Oh yeah, that's a good one, that's a good one. For those of you that haven't, this is a great story. Uh, back in the, the, the dark ages of SharePoint 2007 and Windows 2003, uh, we didn't get patches on Patch Tuesday, I don't think back then. Patch Tuesday was just a, a glimmer in its parents' eye at that point. Um, but patches would just kind of randomly come out. And at some point in the middle of the Windows 2003 and Windows 2007 cycle, stuff just quit working, like search. Like one day search was happily crawling and finding stuff and the next day, nada, nothing. Uh, and so I would do the thing, I would log into a server, I would try to hit a web page, I would get access denied. Now, I'm terrible at typing passwords, uh, so I normally blame myself, but man, I kept getting access denied. So it turns out Microsoft had found out about a security uh, problem called a reflection attack. Um, and at the Windows level, so not IIS and not even SharePoint, but way down at the, the bowels of Windows, the LSA, uh, some bad guys figured out a way to steal passwords. And uh, so if you're on a Windows box and you're looking at something locally and you've got like a client server thing going on, Windows is smart enough to understand they're running on the same box. Instead of going through all the network stack stuff, it says, okay, here's a piece of memory essentially where your password is, just grab it, give it to the server. But if it thinks it's a network thing, then it does a thing, it hashes the network and it sends it out and it comes, sends it back to the server application, the server application gets it and all that. What the bad guys figured out is if they could have a client and server process on the same box, but trick Windows into doing the network way, if they owned both of those processes, they had both halves of the password conversation, they could figure your password out. Reflection attack. It's like that old uh, 80s horror movie thing, you know, the call's coming from inside the house. It's, it's that whole deal, but the request is coming through. So they figured out how to do both of those things. So at the Windows level, Microsoft said, you know, nope, they slapped the hand, and they said, if you see a client and a server process on the same box, 
but the client is not using the server's name, it's using some other name or some other way, give it access denied, no matter what. So if I've got a search server called search01, and I've got a local host file that goes to portal.contoso.com, and it loops back, it gets this uh, loopback detection, or loopback, yeah. So my script that does that shuts off the loopback detection so that you can, so if you do any of these things and you're getting these crazy access denied and you don't know why, loopback detection, that's what it is. Christian. <laughs> so, so Christian called me on it again. Again, there's the easy way and the right way. <laughs> the easy way is to disable it completely. So there's a key you can go in that says disable loopback detection, hell yes, and then everything just works. Christian uh, correctly says there's a better way to do it where you can put a white list of URLs in. So the loopback detection prevents all these other uh, reflection attacks, but will let your SharePoint traffic through. The problem with that, though, is the same problem with that host file. So number one, that I, I've not had that work. If I go in and shut the loopback detection off, immediately everything works. If I do the whitelist thing, sometimes I gotta reboot, sometimes I gotta swear. There's just a whole combination of things, but the disabling it works every time right out of the shoot. But again, the problem is if a year down the road, if you add more URLs, you forget about that. Uh, if you had host name site collections. So you're right, that's the correct way to do it, and that's probably what I should tell people to do, but that's not what I do. So we, Burned a bunch of time on that. Uh, so that's the hardware thing. You're probably gonna need more hardware. The other thing is you've got things like the distributed cache running. They don't take RAM. Um, so that's one of the things when you're testing 2013 and kind of moving things around, pay attention to the hardware. Um, okay, here's another one that I've screwed up. How many of you have added additional managed paths to your farm or to your web apps? All right, so this is the piece that out of the box, you've got you know, the server name or the, the, the web app name, portal.contoso.com, and your managed paths are the places where you can put site collections. So out of the box, you get sites, uh, and then on the, you, know, the, you get the personal one for the MySite host. This is the place where uh, site collections live. There are two types of managed paths, wildcard and explicit. Wildcard means uh, many site collections go here, so sites is an example of that. Explicit means one site collection goes here. That, um, that, ma that managed path information is stored in the configuration database. If you think back 45 minutes ago <laughs> to when I showed the databases where we could bring over, the config database was not one of them. So the place where all that lives isn't there. But what we have in the content databases is we have the URLs for all the site collections. So if we don't create our managed paths in our new farm first, when SharePoint 2013 gets that content database, it says, oh, he's got, uh, he's got a site collection called portal.contoso.com slash foo slash bar. I better create an explicit managed path called foo slash bar. And then if I've got foo slash something else, and what it ends up doing is it doesn't understand there's supposed to be a wild card there, and it creates explicit managed paths for every single one of your site collections. Um, so there's two problems with that. Number one is every request that comes into SharePoint gets matched against that list. And I think the, uh, the hardware and software uh, guidelines for SharePoint 2013 say so you should have 20 of them, or 10, I forget, but not hundreds, which is what you'll end up with. Uh, so you don't want that, it's a performance thing. The other thing is once you figure out that that's happened, which will be the next time you try to create a site collection and that's not in the drop down there, you can't add it later because there's already explicits that are in there. So then what you end up having to do is detach all your databases, <laughs> go back and create it, bring it all back in. So in your old farm, go in and look at your managed paths, see what you've got, create those first so that uh, SharePoint 2013 knows about them. The other thing that you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you upgrade the root of your web app first. So if you've got multiple uh, content databases and you've got portal.contoso.com, you know, slash is the root, you wanna do that content database first. The reason for that is that SharePoint gets kinda of lazy. And there's a bunch of things that exist like under the, uh, the layouts, directory, virtual directory, and VTI bin and all that. That SharePoint gets lazy, and if you're at some deep path site collection somewhere, and it doesn't wanna to try to figure out where it's at, it will just try to find these common files at the root. And if the root's not there, hilarity ensues. Um, so always upgrade that content database first, or attach it first. Now the obvious question with that comes, what if I'm not gonna upgrade that site collection? What if the root of my web app is just a mess? It's horrible, we customized it, it's terrible, we fired the guy that set it up, uh, we're gonna create a new one. What do we do? Well, it's easy, you just create one. 
You just create one on the 2013 side. As long as there's something there for SharePoint, it doesn't have to be the thing you upgraded, but you have to do that one first. The other thing is try to use the same URLs. So if your 2010 farm is portal.contoso.com, try to make 2013 portal.contoso.com. It's gonna make things a lot easier for you. It's gonna make things a lot easier for your users, which makes things a lot easier for you. Um, that's the, the, best, the best route to go. That gets tricky with testing because you're probably gonna have your production 2010 farm up and your test 2013 farm, and they've got the same URLs. Um, so a couple of things on that. Number one, I recommend that every SharePoint farm ever have its own set of service accounts. Um, I've got a hysterical story. Ah, what the heck. <laughs> I'll share this story. Uh, the reason that I've become so militant about that is back, way back when I was a young SharePoint administrator, bright-eyed, the world was my oyster, um, I was setting up a test environment. And this was SharePoint 2003, so you could copy the config database and all that around. And I just took a copy of my farm and I put it in a virtualization environment. And same service account, same passwords, easy peasy. Um, and at the time, the farm that I did this to, the production farm was in California, and I lived in Iowa, well, I live in Iowa, and that's where my test farm was. So I set this test farm up and made sure everything worked and, and done some uh, diddling with my local host files so I could get to those URLs and everything was great. I worked at a software company that wrote add-ons for SharePoint. And so that's what I was testing. We were upgrading our software. And back then, there were no solutions and all that kind of stuff and features. So anytime you added customizations, it had to write directly to the web config file and add things, add uh, assemblies and things like that. So it was right before lunch, and I bring up my test environment, and I bring up the installer for our software, and I log in with the service account for our test environment, which also happens to be the service account for our production environment. Remember that part. It's going to be very important here in a minute. Um, so I go in there, and I next, 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 and it says, where is your SQL database? Now, the question that I read on that screen was, hey, Todd, what's the only SQL database in the entire world that I'll look at? I gave it my, my test SQL database. In reality, the question that it was asking was, hey, Todd, give me one SQL database, and I will look in every nook and cranny on that SQL database for references to any other SQL database, and I will go there, too. Um, so set that up, next, 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 finish, and I went to lunch. And so about 15 minutes, 20 minutes into lunch, I started getting these crazy emails about pages crashing, web parts not working, and like, <laughs> silly users. I went back to eating my burrito and all that, and then my boss calls about 10 minutes later, and he's like, everything's exploding, wherever you're at is less important than this, come back to the office. So I uh, come back, and it, I was uh, kind of ahead of my time. I had two monitors back then, so I log in. I unlock my workstation. In one screen, this upgrade had now been running for about an hour. It should have taken 10 minutes. So I see it running in the little bar. And on the other screen, SharePoint is exploding before my eyes. And I'm like, this can't be a coincidence. <laughs> These two things have to be related. I can't quite put my finger on it. So since we wrote the software, I, could, I called the dev, and I actually pulled him out of a presentation. Well, so I had a sidekick. Imagine how crappy that job must be. And I'm like, go, go get him, go get him. So he's in front of a room with a bunch of people, and he's doing a presentation like this. And my sidekick walks in, and he's like, you need to come see Todd. I don't know what's going on, but he's freaking out. You need to get in there. So what had happened was um, my, the copy of the production database that I'd used had a reference to itself in the, you know, my test environment, and that installer had found it and was now going across the WAN and destroying all of the websites in production because it had the name of all the production web servers, all the production SQL servers. And since I had logged into that box as a service account that had permissions to that farm, it could do it, and it did it. <laughs> and it destroyed SharePoint on that farm. So had I been good and had a second set of service accounts for my test farm, it would have tried to do that, but it wouldn't have had any access, and it would have just failed, and I would have not been mocked for months afterwards. They did things like slip McDonald's applications under my door, and things like that. <laughs> Good times, and now I'm a consultant. Uh, so, so that's one of the things that I do. So for that reason, every farm gets its own service accounts, but the other thing is you're gonna have uh, web pages that have URLs hard linked into them. So what I recommend is when you install your uh, farm that will eventually become your 2013 production farm, give everything the correct names, give it portal.contoso.com, but then create an alternate access mapping, test-portal.contoso.com. So whenever you create a web app, give it the name at creation that will be the most correct, and then add the alternate access mapping later, 
Don't create the test URL first and add production later. It's a, it's a mess. Um, but when you do that, you're going to end up with some pages. People are going to have uh, absolute URL links in there somewhere. And if you're logged in as an account that has permission in both places, you may jump from one to the other and not realize it. And then do things like, well, I wonder what happens if I delete this web. Phone lights up, everybody's screaming. Uh, so every farm gives its own service accounts. And that keeps some of that shenanigans from, uh, from happening. Um, every time inside of the, you know, files of the file system or, or uh, SQL. If you see 14, that's SharePoint 2010. If you see 15, that's SharePoint 2013. For those of you that are using Office 365 now, which version is that? 16, yeah, I see where they're going. Uh, so that was crazy because back in the day, SharePoint 2003 was version five. SharePoint 2007 was version six. <laughs> SharePoint 2010 was version 14. Uh, but they seem to have kind of found a stride there. They're, they're sticking with that. Uh, but anytime you see folders or whatever, that's, uh, that's what that is. So a couple of cool things about this. SharePoint 2013 will allow you to create SharePoint 2010 site collections. So kind of st step back. Let me see if we got this on the next slide. Nope. Um, so when you went from SharePoint 2007 to SharePoint 2010, when you attached those databases or did your upgrade, everything in the, in the guts of your database and the guts of your site collection got upgraded to 20. 10, but the look still looked like 2007. And then at the web level, you could switch the look between 2010 and 20, uh, 2007. That is not how it works, going from 2010 to 2013. So all that stuff that you, you figured out and all that stuff is not the same. When you upgraded 2013, when you attached your database, it just kind of jiggles some database stuff, some schema things. The idea is to make that database attach just as quickly as it can. But everything stays, all the site collections are still 2010 site collections. And then when you do your upgrade, you do it at the site collection level. And you can't back out of it. Once you make a 2010 site collection 2013, it's 2013 till the end of time. Um, so that's why this is a, a thing, because now in 2013, you can actually create those 2010 site collections. That's got two great benefits to it. Number one, uh, we're going to talk about the whole upgrade mechanism and all the timer jobs and all the wackiness that goes on in the background. Uh, what you don't have to do when you're first trying to figure this out is keep restoring a 2010 database and upgrading it. What you can do is in 2013, create a bunch of 2010 site collections, populate them with data, and then upgrade them that way. So it makes the testing a little easier. The other thing is that it lets you ease your users into 2013. Again, nobody here likes it when the users call, not a single person. Um, so this gives you the ability to upgrade SharePoint to 2013, but keep everything looking like 2010 and feeling like 2010 so your users don't freak out until you're ready for them to freak out. Hopefully you're you know, doing some training, doing some lunches or whatever, but you can make it so that you can't create SharePoint 2013 site collections. So everything looks the same, mostly. So that's two advantages to that. And that's something that you can change in Central Admin. You have the option per web app of saying you can create both 2010 and 2013, only 2010 or only 2013. So a lot of flexibility there. How many of you guys are using the Office web apps in 2010? Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, that's, that's good. That's one of my favorite technologies in, inside of Microsoft. This whole idea that you can have Word and Excel and PowerPoint and OneNote inside the browser. That's great stuff. I love it. In 2010, when those came out, they required that you install them on a SharePoint server. You had to install them on SharePoint. In 2013, they've gone the polar opposite. Now, you cannot install them on a SharePoint server. So this is another example where you're going to need more hardware if you're running the Office web apps. And if you've got a volume license with Microsoft, they're free, they're included. If you've got the Office premium or whatever for the clients, and this, so the, other, the, the good thing about them being on their separate server is now multiple technologies can use them. SharePoint can use it, obviously, or we wouldn't be talking about it. Exchange can use it with uh, Outlook Anywhere. So now you can, somebody can get their web mail you know, in, in the browser and open up Word documents inside of the browser. So if they're on the road or whatever. Link can use it. It's an open standard now. It's uh, called WAPI, which is awesome. I love WAPI. I forget what it stands for. It's just cool to call it WAPI. Um, but the Office web apps are now a WAPI server, and any uh, WAPI client can consume them. So you can make your own WAPI clients. Uh, Victor uh, uh, Weiland, he's running around here. He's written some WAPI server and WAPI client things. Um, the other thing this will do is it will render PDFs in the browser. That's pretty cool. 
So now you don't have to worry about having Acrobat or whatever installed. It will let you edit PDFs in the browser. That's pretty cool. Um, so the Office web apps are great, but they do require their own server. So you're gonna have to budget for that. Um, they do require claims, which we're gonna talk about later. Um, and they do require the special Office version. Now the other thing that they will do is if, you're, if you had them in 2010, for every content database that you turned this on for, it would create a site collection for caching. It doesn't use that anymore, so that site collection is not gonna upgrade when you go through and do your upgrades. You can just delete that one. It's, uh, it's kind of like Office View and Cache, I think is the name of it. Um, you don't have to worry about that. But if you've got them licensed, I would highly recommend using them. Uh, but again, they're gonna require their own server or servers. This is a sad one. How many of you guys used pre-upgrade check going from 2007 to 2010? Wasn't it glorious? The first thing about that is that uh, STS ADM operation didn't show up until Service Pack 2, which as you guys will remember is the service pack you needed to be at to upgrade to 2010. So this was a great litmus test right out of the chute if you were gonna see if you, you know, what the problems were with your farm. If you typed STS ADM dash O pre-upgrade check and STS ADM said, I have no idea what you're talking about. This operation does not exist. That let you know you weren't at the right uh, patch level. So that was one great thing that it did. But the other thing that it did was it created a great catalog of your farm. All the solutions that were installed, all the content databases, all the site collections, and how big everything was, and all the problems that it found, the, the long lists, the white lists, it was great. It was awesome. And then they took it away. <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so now if you've got a SharePoint 2010 farm, and you want to go to 2013, you don't have this tool. Uh, so one of the things that you can use is test SP content database database name in the web application. You can run this on your 2010 farm before you detach or you know, copy the database over. And it will do things like tell you if you've got large lists or wide lists, things like that. Um, but then you also run it on the 2013 side before you attach your database to make sure that everything's good. And we're gonna, I got some screenshots, we'll look at that. Uh, great tool, it is not mandatory. You can attach your database without running test SP content database, you'd be silly. To do that though. Doesn't cost you anything and it's going to kind of give you an idea what's, uh, what's coming up. Like I said, we got some screenshots on that. Um, features and solutions. So you guys were all very good and very vigilant and when those evil developers tried to inject code on your servers, you made them do it in solutions and features, right? Yeah, okay. So the good news about that is they all pretty much upgrade uh, out of the box. So there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, Microsoft has jiggled the APIs around in the background, but they've made everything, you know, they've put stubs in so everything keeps working. Don't take this as uh, me saying you don't need to fuss with them. When you're doing your upgrade, uh, one of the mantras, and I actually looked in the book this morning and I've actually got it as a heading in one of my things in the book. One of my mantras for upgrading is don't upgrade crap. And that is uh, just one of the things that will do you the most good when you're doing your upgrade. Don't upgrade crap means don't upgrade services or solutions or features that you're not using. Don't upgrade crap means don't uh, upgrade ones that aren't any good that have caused your problems. Don't upgrade crap means don't upgrade site collections that you're not using anymore, things like that. That's just a great way as you're working through this, you're like, is this crap? Todd doesn't think I should upgrade this. Um, so don't upgrade crap. So when you're doing you know, your evaluations and all that, and you're looking at your solutions and features, two questions you should ask yourself. Number one, are we actually using this? Do we need to upgrade this? If not, it's out of there. And number two, if you are using it, is there a newer version? Is there a better version? Uh, if it's something that your guys in house have written, uh, maybe have them look at the code for 2013 and see how things have changed, see if there's a better way to do it now. If it's a commercial thing, see if there's a new version that supports 2013. Um, and for the most part, with very few exceptions, solutions in that that work for 2013 will install in 2010. So there's logic inside of those solutions that say, you know, if there's a 2010 farm, do this. If there's a 2013 farm, do this. So you're able to, you know, do it on production if you want to, or if not, put it in 2013. Uh, and then your stuff should, uh, should work when it comes over. But this is a good time to look back at this and say, you know, do I need all these things? Is there better versions of this? I've kind of forgotten about that. Uh, it's a good time to look at that. Now, I normally do these uh, presentations with a, uh, a guy, Shane Young. Uh, it's mo mostly because I feel sorry for him. I don't think he's got a lot of friends, and so I kind of let him hang out with me. It's, uh, I'm a good guy. 
he sort of has a blog, and one of the things that he wrote a while back was a blog post that will walk through your 2010 farm and extract all of your solutions. So your solutions, as you know, are files, WSP files. Ideally, on your server somewhere, you have a folder where you keep all these WSP files. In reality, almost never happens. Um, but if you find yourself in that case and you've got this WSP, the solution in 2010, you're like, we have to have this, but we can't find this anywhere. And that CodePlex project is gone, or you know, this got.net project is gone. What do we do? This PowerShell will walk through your 2010 farm and extract all of your solutions out of your config database and drop them in your file system. So then you can move them over to 2013 and, and load them back in. So that's kind of a nice, uh, nice little tool. But that's that blog, hideously uh, URL blog post right there. Authentication, all right. How many of you guys are still running 2010? Gonna upgrade, okay. How many of you are using claims in 2010? Okay, good, that's about right. That's about five hands too many, but uh, okay. When you move to 2013, how many of you plan on using claims in 2013? All of you, everybody gets to use claims in 2013. So in 2010, claims was kind of an experiment, kind of a beta, sort of. Uh, it, it wasn't a good experience. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. In 2013, though, you have to have it. All these things that they've broken out, the Office web apps and Workflow Manager and all this other crazy stuff require claims. You have to go to claims. Um, so you need to get used to that. Now, my recommendation, so you can convert from classic, which is what we always had, to claims. You can do it on the 2010 side or the 2013 side. I always recommend doing it on the 2013 side. And here's why. On the 2010 side, if you do it on the 2010 side, what's another name for your 2010 farm? Production, Production. exactly. <laughs> on your 2013 farm, if you install it and do it all over there, it's not production until you flip the switch and do the DNS stuff and alert all your users. On 2010, if you convert your web app to claims and everything explodes, you just broke production. You don't wanna break production. So that's one reason I tell you to always do it in 2013. The other reason I tell you to do it in 2013 is because it's easier and I'm lazy. Um, how many of you have done the claims conversion in 2010? It's like four lines of PowerShell and you gotta loop through all this thing and for each user, blah -de blah foo, blah, splot. In 2013, how do you do it? A single line, convert SP web application, done. And if you add another database, what do you do? Convert SP web application, done. Nothing to it. It's way easier in 2013. And in the case of upgrade and in this context, that's not gonna be a production environment. So always do it in 2013. And so now I've got some screenshots of some stuff that we've talked about. So I hope you guys can all see that. You in the back that are still awake, everybody see that? All right, good. Um, so this is a test SP content database uh, thing that I'm running on 2013. I've got a Database from 2010 that is using the classic authentication. So this is probably what you're gonna see when you start doing your upgrades. So I've got this classic database from a classic web app and I'm attaching it to upgrade.contoso.com for really good uh, you know, demonstrations here called upgrade. So what this is telling me is telling me a couple of things. It's telling me there's a setup file missing, a web part. That's gonna show up everywhere. When you see that report viewer.dwp, that's everywhere. Every farm has it, you didn't screw anything up. The second one is this one that says, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Um, this is a classic uh, content database, but your web app is claims. The wheels have just begun to fall off. Uh, the good news is it will still attach. So the other thing, and we'll talk about SP, or test SP content database, we've got this upgrade blocking property here. You'll notice for both of these, this is false. So when I do test SP content database, I usually get a string of crud, I get that, that report viewer one, I get a bunch of stuff, and I'm like, ah, I don't care. If it doesn't say upgrade blocking, I'm probably just gonna mount the database and see what happens. Just throw caution to the wind and, and look. So when you're looking through these, don't get freaked out unless that upgrade blocking is false. But this one is telling me that I've got a claims web app and a classic database. So this will not happen originally because you'll probably create your web app in 2013. You'll probably create it as classic, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute and you'll attach your classic databases and everybody will be happy. But then at some point you're gonna convert that to claims because you're gonna to wanna to use the Office web apps, you're gonna to wanna to use workflow, you're gonna to wanna to use all these other things. And then you're gonna keep attaching databases 
and they're going to keep being classic, and you're going to get that error. Don't freak out. Just run the, run the convert again, and it'll be fine. Um, come back here. Okay, so this is a slide that kind of talks about all that. Um, this has the line to create a classic web app, because in 2013, claims is the default, to the point where if you create a web app in central admin, it doesn't even ask you. It just creates claims. You can't create a classic web app in central admin. The good news is we've got PowerShell, and so this line up here will create a new web app in 2013 and create it in the classic mode. So you can attach those databases and not get any errors. If over the time that you've been doing all this, you've kind of forgotten who's who and what's where, you can run get SP web application and get the use claims authentication property. That will be true or false. I think we can all figure out what true and false means there. Uh, so that'll give you a list of all your web apps and which ones are using claims and which ones aren't. And then if you've got a classic one and you, uh, you need to convert it to claims, that's the command right there. There are two steps to this conversion process. The first one is at the web app level. So you're telling the web app, go into IIS, do some jiggling, and do claims-based authentication. That's the first step. The second step is it goes into every content database for that web app and it replaces the classic usernames with claims-based usernames. And that's how everything works. If you, if, you, um, if you do this, if you attach this database, it will work, except nobody will be able to get in because they will try to log in with a claims-based user in the background. Obviously, your users don't understand this. But IIS will pass a claims-based user to SharePoint, and SharePoint will compare it to a classic user in the database and not let them in. So only people that will be able to get in are people who have web app policies, so like your farm account or whatever. Um, so when you run this, it does kind of a find with replace and fixes all that. As you add more databases that are classic, like I said, you just keep rerunning the single command. And it looks in and it says, oh, the web app's already uh, converted, no problem. This database, oh, here's one, and it just reconverts them. So that's the, super easy. We got like one minute till break time here. All right, so this is what this looks like. Up here, I've got this convert legacy web application uh, from, claim, or from legacy to claims. Um, the other thing is when you're doing this in PowerShell, if you can't remember what the verbs and all that kind of stuff are, you've got tab complete. So you can do dash, tab, 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 and you'll see to and from. And then after the to and from, you can tab, 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 and it will tab through the values that it accepts, since it will only accept certain ones. So you don't have to worry about remembering that. It gives you a thing that says, are you sure we're going to do some stuff? Oh, we're sure. Are you really, really sure? We're really, really sure. Um, it's doing that. It couldn't convert some users. The database that I did when I did this test had users for a domain that was not the domain I was in. And we'll see a screenshot of that in a minute. Um, so it couldn't convert some. And then it came back. <laughs> and I did just a get, a get SP site to show what uh, site collections I had. And just to show that didn't upgrade anything. It's still 2010, but it's claims. Uh, and then I tried to find out if a site collection was using claims, and that's absolutely dumb, and PowerShell yelled at me. And I left that in for your amusement. As I'm, <laughs> I had a script on one screen, and I was doing this on the other screen, and I still screwed it up. Uh, so don't do that. <laughs> Instead, um, do the get SP web application, give it your web application name, and then use claims, and we can see that it's true now, where it used to be false. The other thing that I did here, and I'll let you guys go, is you'll notice I didn't put a URL here for any of these uh, get web applications. When you create a web application, you can give it a name and a URL, and any of the web application commandlets will take either. So again, I'm lazy, and typing the uh, seven letters that is upgrade is way easier to type than HTTP. <laughs> so I always give my web apps super short, easy typable names so that I can do that kind of stuff. All right, so it is 10 o'clock. So we are at a break here. Uh, go out, get some coffee, splash some cold water on your face, uh, and come back in uh, 10 minutes, and we'll pick up and have the exciting conclusion of upgrading to SharePoint 2013.